Welcome everyone to seminar one of the Centre of Research Excellence um, in the Prevention of Falls Injuries. Um, today we have a topic on technology to support exercise to prevent falls in community dwellers. But before we get going, I'd like to um, start by acknowledging um, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we're all um, meeting on today and um, the various lands you're all on, joining in on Zoom. I'm on Gadigal land um, and so I'd like to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation and to um, Elders past, present and emerging. So before we start our presentation. Um, we just wanted to do a plug for an upcoming seminar that we have coming up that will be, um, we have a special guest for, um, Professor Andrew Clegg, who is the Head of Ageing and Stroke Research at the University of Leeds and an Honorary Consultant Geriatrician at Bradford Royal Infirmary. And he'll be giving a presentation on stratified care for older people, so targeting interventions to those most likely to benefit. It will be a hybrid event, so um, we'd love to see lots of people in person, but you should be able to um, register virtually as well. And that's coming up in May. Um, Wednesday at 11 a.m. So watch this space for um, material around registering your interests and ability to attend. Now on to today's seminar. So we have three um, presenters today. We're lucky to have um, and they'll be covering various aspects of, as I said, technology mm -hmm. to support exercise to prevent falls in community dwellers. I think Dana is going to kick us off. Um, and so Dana is um, a senior lecturer in anatomy at the UNS at University of New South Wales Medicine and a co conjoint senior research scientist at Neura. She has a PhD in biomechanics um, and her research focuses on understanding biomechanical sensory motor and neurocognitive contributions contributions to balance and falls in older people. So um, Dana and all of our presenters today are happy for you to guys to ask questions throughout. You can use the chat, I'll monitor that, um, and we can potentially have a little bit of joint discussion between each um, presentation, but we can also play that a little bit by ear. So I will stop um, sharing to let Dana share her screen. Share sound, share my screen. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you all for joining us and thanks for having me to talk about this, um, I guess, a study and some um, additional work that we've been doing to um, have older people exercising in a fun way. So there's been a lot of research leading up to the, the, the main study and then a lot of work in terms of um, figuring out how to get this discovery or this um, this exergaming system that we've developed um, available for older people to um, to benefit from. So I'm going to talk about the challenges of commercialization at the very end. All right, so let's start off. I don't know who knows about this system. It's called Smart Step. Um, and it's basically an exergaming system that this is just a silly busy slide, but basically to get, um, give the impression that or um, indicate that this um, idea of this exergaming system came from decades of research um, of ours and other people's work to understand mm -hmm. risk factors for falls um, in older people. Uh, so cohort studies, as well as uh, reviewing the literature to understand the physical, cognitive, health, demographic factors that might contribute to falls. Um, and I guess from that, one of the um, tests that was devised by Stephen Lord and Richard Fitzpatrick was this choice stepping reaction time test, which was a nice composite measure of some of the other risk factors um, that we would identified uh, for falls. So it was a pretty good uh, predictor. This performance in this test is a pretty good predictor of future fall risk. Um, and it's interesting in that it is a composite measure of, um, like I said before, some sensory motor as well as cognitive um, function. So it was found to be associated with uh, balance, uh, speed or reaction time, um, strength, as well as executive functioning. So you can see it's a nice composite measure of some of the factors, or some of the functions that are really important for us to maintain our balance and avoid falling over. So not... Too different from this is this DDR game. Um, 
I don't know if that's everyone. We could probably pause the video now. I can't hear the video at all. I don't know why. Oh, that sounds oh. little. Uh, but thank you, Charlotte. I'll pause <laughs> no. it. But you got the idea um, that, you know, that the choice stepping your extra time test looks a little bit like this fun game. And the idea was born that why why shouldn't we um, develop this type of test into a more of a training um, training system and have older people training these types of functions that we think are important for preventing falls. Okay, so the um, this is what it looks like. It's a, a wireless mat um, that is installed in people's homes um, and it's talking to a very small computer that can be plugged into the television or can be plugged into a computer monitor so that you can view the games. And by stepping on the mat, you interact with the game. So basically playing games, like you can see here, it's Tetris um, by stepping on the mat. Um, and in stepping on the mat, the idea is that we're challenging balance. Um, but the other idea is that with playing games, uh, we can easily integrate some cognitive challenges into the training. So rather than just a physical training system, um, the idea was that this was also a, a cognitive or a brain training system. So it's a home, it was developed to be a home-based system. Um, and we had, did some pilot studies to see that um, it, was, uh, it was beneficial in terms of improving um, stepping and balance and as well as some cognitive functions. So those small studies were done uh, in different settings and uh, and led to our, our grant that we were successful in obtaining in doing a large study uh, in community dwelling people uh, of this system with falls as an outcome. So you need a lot of people for that type of study. So that was the, the big study that was done. I'll talk about it a little bit more. Okay, so that's the system. And what I'm going to do is give you the results straight up rather than the method. So then we'll talk a little bit more about how we implemented this, um, this system into people's homes and how they used it. So um, getting cutting straight to the chase, we found a um, significant reduction in terms of the rate of falls in people doing this exagame step training program compared to the control group. Uh, so we had 769 people in this trial and there was three arms to the trial. So I'm not going to talk about the third arm, which was purely brain, well, it, it was a brain training arm. I'm just going to talk about the exagame step training in the control group. So that was two thirds of our participants. And you can just see there that we had the number of falls in the exagame step training group was, was reduced compared to control. And that was um, a significant benefit of about 26%. And that was our primary outcome, the rate of falls over 12 months. Um, and that's the 12 months that people were using this system. So uh, like I said, you know, the incident rate ratio is 0.74 uh, and that's statistically significant. So that was a really nice finding. Um, and we had some nice results in terms of our secondary falls outcomes. Uh, so the, the proportion of fallers um, in, the, in the training group was significantly reduced compared to the control. So we had a nice result in terms of fall preventing falls um, with this training system. And it was published uh, in January of this year uh, in Nature Medicine. So you can do, use the QR code to grab that paper if you're interested in reading it. Uh, uh, sorry, yeah, all the information is there, but I think um, what was published alongside it was this nice little editorial, which is actually arguably a, a, a more enjoyable read. So if you'd like to pull that up, it's only like a page and this page and another half. Um, so it's a nice, easy read if you'd like to read that. And it was really nice to have this editorial go alongside uh, the RCT results and really sort of push the, um, that falls is an issue um, and it needs addressing. All right. So Dana, can I, can I ask you a question? What's please. the impact factor of um, nature medicine? Um, I might have looked it up, Kathy. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's about 70. And I thought Nature Medicine is just, you know, another journal, um, but Nature being the main journal um, would be the big one. But I think Nature Medicine mm -hmm. has a higher impact factor than Nature itself. 
So I didn't realise how big of a deal it was to publish in Nature Medicine, but um, walking around the halls of the university and people stopping you and congratulating you like um, made me realise that it was a really big deal, at least at this university. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're really grateful that there was a great editor that um, obviously was really interested in this topic and, and understood it's, it's an issue, um, falls as an issue, because this type of journal doesn't normally publish this type of paper. Um, you know, it's, you know, we struggled to get it into those really big journals. So it was awesome. And I had a lot of support and help um, from people, including many who are on this, um, on this seminar. So I thank them. <clears throat> Uh, okay, so recruiting 769 people living in the community, I thought I'd just show this slide. We originally planned to um, involve Medibank and recruit people on their private health insurance um, registry, which went okay and we got started with them, but it, it really it, it didn't turn out as we'd hoped. So we sort of went our own way a little bit and advertised in the Sydney Morning Herald, and you can see we got 81 people in 2017 that way. Um, and then our biggest um, windfall in terms of recruitment was adv advertising in the seniors card newsletter. <clears throat> so we put, they did that for free for us back then. I don't think they do it for free anymore, but um, they did. They put a, an ad in the, in the newsletter and it went around to, I guess, all the seniors card holders. And we came in one Monday and we had like 600 phone phone call, uh, phone messages, voicemail messages that we had to return. So suddenly I had to um, get very busy and uh, recruit more research assistants to try and um, manage the number of people that were keen to join the trial based on the seniors card. And then um, yeah, word of mouth being the other, the other, the other um, way that we recruited participants. So... Uh, I know that these days Facebook's used a lot for recruiting research participants, um, old people. People say, oh, no, older people aren't on social media, but, yes, they are. They absolutely are, and Facebook's been really helpful for some of our other, other studies to recruit older people. Um, so those are the recommendations, and if you can get into something like Seniors Cards, obviously, um, I recommend doing that. So there was, uh, yeah, 837 recruitment inquiries, um, over a thousand assessments conducted, um, and over fifteen hundred home visits conducted um, to to um, complete this trial, which was done over a five year period. And the participants themselves were involved for twelve months. So, how did we do it? We uh, obviously we recruited the participants and screened them at that point, um, and then we invited them into our our research. Institute and did a baseline assessment, which was a couple of hours long. We showed them a video um, to give them an indication of what the intervention was like and just to make sure that we um, we are recruiting people that were interested to, um, to be involved in such an intervention. And that was, that was helpful. I don't think too many people said um, no after watching the video and getting an idea of what would be involved, but um, because they obviously did know to some extent Although there were some people that came through the trial and ended up saying, oh, I'm just not interested in computer games when um when they, you know, they do withdraw. So you always um you always have some interesting, <clears throat> interesting people come through. But um most people were very open to this intervention being, you know, playing computer games. Um so we did the baseline assessment and then randomized people to, to and and then um, arranged a home visit for the intervention group participants. So those home visits were generally um, one to two hours in length, and, and we would have a research assistant go out to people's homes. Those research assistants happened to have an exercise science or equivalent type of um, undergraduate degree. But I would say in hindsight, it's not essential. Um, there were some key things that are important to check that people are safe and that they're exercising appropriately, but easily uh, you'd easily be able to train other people up to do that type of thing. If you've got a really good research assistant, say with a science degree or some other, um, even a psychology degree, I think it'd be, um, it'd be possible to do. So they visited the home um, for the initial installation and training. So that involved showing people how to plug everything in and turn it on and how to um, get going with the games. So some people you'd get through the whole games and explain them all. 
Other people, you'd just do one or two and get them going. And then the idea was that we'd come back two weeks later and check that people are continuing to play the games and exercise safely and continuing to or trying to progress themselves. So obviously, as we know, exercise needs to be progressive. So we encourage people to progress themselves through the, the levels of the games and to beat their high scores and um, in that way progress their exercise and progress the challenge. Uh, in terms of safety, we made sure that um, at the baseline assessment that people could do that choice stepping reaction time test independently and safely. And when we installed the systems in people's homes, uh, we had an option for leaving them with a like a mobility aid, like a mobility walker, but without the wheels um, that could be placed in place and could it was like a grab rail if required um, while the person was doing the stepping um, exit games. So that wasn't needed very often, actually. Um, so it would be left, um, in oh. case to get going and then the idea that when you came back for the second visit we'd be ideally taking that um, mobility aid away so that people don't um, instinctively grab the, the the bars and therefore reduce the balance challenge um, in terms of the exercise so you can see the components of the of the system there um, basically just a little computer box and the mat and it was plugged into you know, um, uh, screen. We asked people to train um, for two hours per week for 12 months. Um, we capped it at 150 minutes per week because we had that third group, the second the brain training group that we thought that they may, um, may sit down and play for hours on end and forget to get up and stop playing the game. So um, we didn't think that would happen so much in people that were standing. So we capped it at 150 minutes per week to try and keep the dose between those two intervention groups the same. Uh, but basically, people chose their own games. Uh, we asked them to play two games uh, um, um, each time that they were training, but then they could open up um, the other games and play what they liked. We encouraged them to progress, like I said, and um, and to beat their high scores and to meet um, meet the the recommended dose of two hours per week. The amount of gameplay that uh, people did, the data came back to our server. And uh, we monitored that. And if people were uh, doing less than 80 minutes for two weeks in a row, then we would give them a call and check in, see if anything's wrong. Sometimes the equipment failed, for example, or some of them well, we'd check in on them. Um, and if it was just a matter of not being able to motivate themselves to do the exercise, we did have some conversations around um, making SMART goals to try and get um, uh, get back to the exercise and get up to the dose that we were, um, we were asking for the trial. So those conversations happened on occasion. So here's the, the, the way the exergames present. There's a, a, a user interface in the top left there, and that is the screen that you can select your games. And to do that, you just step on the mat. So you're able to control the whole thing with the mat. Uh, so you can choose the game you like, uh, choose the level that was appropriate. And obviously our research assistants would set the initial level and encourage people to progress as they saw that they were getting better. Um, there were high scores, there was immediate feedback uh, delivered within the games, for example, well done or you missed or um, immediate feedback in terms of um, um, images as well as sounds. Uh, the idea was to develop games that were not too, um, not too uh, busy and uh, that were sort of age appropriate uh and that were intuitive and easy to use as well as being fun and engaging so some of those games you'll recognize such as tetris and space invaders and some of the games we made ourselves um and the idea with us developing the games was that we had the right balance between the physical challenge and the cognitive challenge and that the cognitive challenges were um were challenging functions that we found uh, were associated with falls in our other studies such as inhibition and um, attention and processing speed. So they, across the top of the user interface there, you can see there's medals, um, gold, silver, and bronze, and people would earn those medals if they played 80, 100, and 120 minutes per week. So the idea would be that you would earn 52 gold medals if you were playing 120 minutes per week for 12 months. All right, so here is someone, this might be loud too, turn it down. 
a lady playing uh, in the home on the left and then just an image on the right that you can see how it looked in people's homes and how they um, how they were playing. Obviously unsupervised. We didn't have any adverse events. So um, other than, so no major ad adverse events, I should say. No one fell while they were playing or training. Uh, there was a couple of sort of uh, achy joints or um, yeah, aggravated sort of um, joint pain because we found when we'd go back and check on these people that they were sort of slamming their foot down and didn't really need to do that. Um, so we just adjusted their technique and managed to resolve pretty much all of those. So it was really great to see that people could do this safely in their own homes unsupervised for 12 months. Uh, this is the information we got back to our server just to show that if people, uh, there was a red highlight there, if someone hadn't been, hadn't done 18 minutes or two weeks in a row and we'd know to call them. Um, we got a whole heap of information back from the boxes, which were connected to Wi-Fi to be able to send the data back to our server. And in all, for each person, 235 columns of data, uh, which we figured out, realised later was a bit of overkill. So, you know, how many steps they did, what games, what levels, what high scores, all this information that was we thought might be interested but interesting but really in the end um we didn't use a lot of that information um so in subsequent trials we probably won't collect quite that amount of information but good to know exactly what they're doing and that amount of time is is the time that they play the game so um you know is a good indicator of exactly how active they are we had some people that you know there there were breakages of the equipment so that um that, they, you know, there was some time lost and obviously people may have had some illness and had some um, some time away from their training for that reason, as well as um, going on lovely long holidays, uh, a lot of the participants. So we'll have a look at the at the um, adherence data in a minute, but we did see that um, you know, people, um, people missed their 120 minutes per week uh, for 12 months for those reasons. All right, so now you can see on the top left there, the blue bar graph, uh, the average minutes per week played over 12 months uh, across all the participants. So you can see there's a bunch there that didn't do very much. And then um, and then you know, another peak at around 100 or 120 minutes per week. Now, remember, we capped the gameplay at 150 minutes. So with other, other types of interventions, you might not see such a... Um, a rapid shift at the at the right side of the scale but um yeah people weren't able to play too much more to uh, supplement for the time lost to illness or other reasons you can see some people played more than 150 minutes and they found a way to cheat the system which um it's great to know because they were obviously very keen uh and and not get locked out of the system after 150 minutes by playing the same game um so good on them they managed to cheat the system and get some more exercise done. On the right side of the pie graph, the darker colours represent um, uh, in a system usability scale uh, responses that indicate that they enjoyed the, the playing the games more so, the lighter colours less so. So just a um, so as a seven point scale, just to show you that majority of people were quite satisfied with using the system. Um, I just popped that image down to the bottom left to show you the medals and the other sort of uh, features that we use to try and um, encourage people to hit the 120 minutes per week and, um, you know, and, and acquire medals that way. Did a little bit of an analysis on what predicts adherence to this, this type of intervention and we found people with a low BMI and less depressive symptoms were more likely to um, play for um, or more likely to play for a longer period each week. Okay, so since we did that big trial, uh, we've done some, well, alongside and um, into the future, we've done some other work in different clinical groups and using this system, seeing if it's appropriate for um, different uh, clinical populations. So there was another large trial, 461 people with multiple sclerosis. Uh, that did six months of this type of training and falls was the primary outcome for that trial as well. And we did not see a significant reduction in falls, but we did see some improvements in their function in terms of improved stepping. Uh, and the QR codes are there for that uh, paper that's been published uh, earlier this, maybe last month. 
another study in Parkinson's disease, but it was a trial that incorporated this type of training along with reactive balance training uh, in our lab. And we found fewer lab induced faults um, that uh, in the in the intervention group compared to the control group. Um, the Parkinson's disease people um, and multiple sclerosis, people with multiple sclerosis, they all found it to be quite feasible uh, and, and, and quite good adherence in the smaller study of Parkinson's disease in multiple sclerosis as people were uh, younger and, you know, generally working with young families and busier. So um, their adherence was pretty good, but we found that the other types of exercise might have dropped off when they were in the intervention group because their net physical activity remained the same um, compared to pre uh, study. A little study in people with cognitive impairment doing just the cognitive training, so not with the stepping mat, but playing with their hands, um, which was a COVID-affected trial and didn't show any significant benefits. Uh, but we're interested to know whether that uh, we can do cognitive training that might benefit um, both the cognitive and physical functions uh, with this these types of games. And now we have a an NH and MRC trial funded for running uh, an intervention using this system in people who have peripheral neuropathy following chemotherapy treatment. And that's commencing this year and there'll be 168 people in this trial. And the idea is to see if we can reduce symptom related burden um, by having people in, people with peripheral neuropathy often have balance challenge, balance problems. And, um, and therefore they sort of don't get back to their regular uh, physical activity and even uh, working type uh, life patterns. So the idea is to get them to do some training to get them back to um, to uh, function in, in their lives the way that they, they would like to. So that's coming up this year. Uh, and it'll take a couple of years for us to get that trial done. That's really uh, nice for to do. Uh, I've, I've talked to maybe some of you on this audience before about our our efforts to implement into aged care and uh, Ality is a uh, aged care provider that we they have 45 homes across Australia. I think we in, rolled out the mats into about 25 or 30 homes um, with variable success. It was again during COVID, it was challenging um, because it re re relied on the staff in the care homes to um, to get this going and to make sure it worked and they get you know get people on it. Um, and there's high turnover and they were very busy people, especially at that time during the pandemic. So they, that in, in some places, they really enjoyed it because it gave um, the residents a, uh, something to come out of their rooms for post um, lockdowns and, and do a little bit of exercise to regain some function that might have been lost while they were in lockdown. Uh, but it was very challenging and um, we learned a lot from this, uh, this implementation trial trying to work with um, in the real world in aged care. But the staff feedback was positive. They, um, yeah, said that they rep they reported noticeable improvements in in the function of residents. And now um, we did. There was some media around the the RCT paper um, being published, and and as a result, we've had about over a thousand people contact us asking, "Can we purchase one of these systems?" Um, so now remains the challenge to commercialize. Um, which you know is the end goal, right? You want you've done got all this great information about how this can be beneficial to older people and you know fun and and people want it, but um, in order to get it out to the public, you've you've got to go through this process of commercialization. And I tell you what, it's not fun. It's it's quite a challenge. And we are not, I, you know, as a researcher, it's not something that I have the skills necessarily to do. So we're navigating this process, um, getting some assistance from the university um, and lawyers and other people. But um, the MS Plus is the is a support service for people with MS and other neurological conditions, and they're actually branching out into aged care services. So they have asked for 40 systems, so we're um, providing those, and that will be our initial um, venture into sort of commercialization uh, to get it going in their clinics that they call wellbeing centers, I think. So um, we're in the process of doing that now, and then hopefully finding pathway for commercialization more broadly that people um, in the general community can access these smart step systems. So I might finish up there. I'd be very happy to take some questions now or later. Obviously, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that were involved in this big trial and then, you know, all the research around it. So thank you very much to everyone for their support.
Wonderful. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, uh, there was one question in the chat from Andrew who I think has had to duck off. It was around um, costs, which may be hard to um, answer if you're still navigating the commercialisation aspects. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the co we've got a, a price point of about $1,000 at this point because the computer, the PC is still quite expensive. Um, and so our, our cost price is about $500 per unit. So for commercialization, we would, you know, double that for, um, you know, for uh, all the other costs associated with commercialization. So that's where we're at at the moment, but we'd like to bring that price point down. I really like to find a, a more um, economical solution for the computer. And that means that we can bring the price point right down. And I, ideally, I would say probably, you know, a $300 price point would be good for people, um, you know, general people living in their homes. I think for centres, for residential care facilities, $1,000 per system is fine. Um, and we've been providing those for that purpose. So uh, that's fine. But, yeah, for individuals in their homes, it would be nice to bring it down to sort of, yeah, three or four or five hundred dollars and then Richard um, wondered whether the potential participants had seen the intervention prior to being randomised and then were those um, allocated to control disappointed? Yeah, someone, some people were disappointed and that happens with any intervention. People are volunteering because they like the idea or the sound of the intervention. Uh, so they were shown um, what the system, you know, what, what the intervention involved and because we didn't want to randomise people that weren't interested in doing it. So they had a bit of an idea. And when they got randomised to control, some people were disappointed. But that's that's the that's what happens with the randomised control trial. Um, and maybe we find some more people drop out in the control group. I can't remember if that happened here. I don't think it did, actually, um, for that purpose. But, yeah, some people were disappointed and would ask... In some trials, so the new trial that we're doing in um, CIPN, we have a wait list control group, which is really nice. So then anyone who's in the control group just has to wait six months and they'll be able to receive the intervention. So that's a really nice option to be able to offer that. Great. Rick has a question. Just a question about commercialisation. You know, obviously there's parallels with We Fit um, because they've got the IT set up. Could you integrate, like, I don't know what the opportunities are with a big company like that to take what you've got and work with you to develop some games that have similar outcomes in your one year have researched. Is that something you've thought about? Yeah, it, it is. And we have been talking with some companies, not so much um, Nintendo, but um, other companies that are doing similar things in Europe uh, and Australia uh, with other kind of um, technology. Um you know, I think that would be great because those companies are already established. They've already gone through the years it takes to set up a company and understand what's required. Um, so I think that's a really good option. Uh, you just need to obviously negotiate what the terms are. And um, so we've been having discussions. We'll see where that leads. But yeah, personally, I think that's a good option, Rick. Yeah. I have a quick question, Dana, around um, the participants that got the follow-up phone calls if they'd done less than 80 minutes. Was that a very large proportion? Oh, we did find mm -hmm. out exactly how many. No. Um, yeah, it was maybe like, I don't know, one in five people had those phone calls. And the interesting thing was that we continued to make those phone calls to the same people over and over again. Mm. That was the same sort of people that kept popping up. Um to the point that we don't actually think that the phone calls help that much. And so for the subsequent trial, we're not going to bother. We'll check in on people and we'll ask how they're going, but we won't bother to track that. And we'll get all the information at the end of the trial, but we won't um, go to all the trouble of getting all that information across on a daily basis because we really didn't think that it helped that much. Well, yeah, and it's less transferable, I guess, in terms of scale up and things. That's not necessarily going to be as feasible to include in the, you know, scale up. Yep. Right. Anyone else? All righty. We'll get on. I think we've got Kim next. Is that correct? Yeah. So while Kim um, shares her screen, I'll introduce her. So Professor Kim Delbert is a senior re principal research scientist with Neura and the director of innovation and translation at the Falls Balance and Injury Research Centre supported by an Australian NHMRC. 
uh, by the Australian NHMRC. Um, she's also a professor at the University of New South Wales. So thanks, Kim. And uh, I'll just um, jump in before Kim starts. We um, rejigged the speakers a little bit and we'll um, have Kim and discussion um, for the rest of the time. And we'll have another um, session with Anne um, focusing on yoga. Thanks, Kathy. Is this sharing the right screen? Um, yeah, the full screen? Yes, that's great. Yes. All right, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yes, um, so I'll, I'll be filling up um, the time um, and I'm happy to take questions after or during. Um, but what I thought to do today is to take you to, through the journey that we have had with Sanding Tool because it's been quite a long journey now, like over eight years. Um, since we started developing this and have run multiple trials. And um, I'll talk through a few of our key points um, as well as share some of the results, which are very much a summary. Um, but I want to start by saying that I can't do this by myself. And this is absolutely um, a large uh, group of people that are um, helping um, to setting these studies up all the way from students, postdocs, research assistants, and, and many, many collaborators. So um, gr grateful to have their support. Um, so I thought maybe I would start by just saying, why did are we doing this? Um, and I think this applies to Dana as well. Um, we know exercise is the single most effective strategy for falls, but we have the problem that people don't adhere to the exercise dose that we require them to do, which is two to three hours a week, based on Kathy's um, wonderful systematic reviews. Um, and so it is very hard to, to make that happen. So that's where we um, thought maybe technology can help because we can provide that higher level of adherence, um, engagement with a fun program that people can do at home. Um, it can provide feedback, continuous monitoring, and it can hopefully be delivered quite cheaply. So that's the overall idea in a nutshell of why we're doing this. Um, but the what I would like to say as as one of the most important things is that um, is is that of co-design. Um, so we have um, always integrated um, older people all the way from the beginning, and um, the program that I will be talking to you about is is an app. Um, uh, but we we incorporated um, the voice of the older user from the start. When we did this, um, it this started in 2011, actually, the co-design phase of Standing Tall. So it's it's actually more than eight years. Um, and so what we what we asked them to was if you would be um, doing exercises using a technology. Um, what do you expect it to be or what are your kind of minimum expectations and what is your desired outcome? And essentially what they said was that they really wanted a design that was flawless essentially so that it wouldn't kind of break, um, but it would also be very clear. It would have big buttons, uh, but not be condescending and just be very clear and on-screen instructions um, offering a variety of different exercises that were tailored to them, but challenging as well. Um, so, and that had to be then, of course, for every individual using the app at any point in time. Um, and also including behavior change strategies to make sure that we actually keep them engaged and, um, and have that long-term adherence. Um, I'll put in um, a reference there of um, a paper by Lisa McGarrigal and, and Chris Todd and others um, about Map the Apps, where they actually have had have done a review about apps um, and how they are incorporating all these different elements. Uh, it's an interesting read. Um, so what is ex what is standing tall? So it's an exercise app that is aimed at um, improving standing balance, transferring, walking balance, stepping and obstacle negotiation. Um, and people can really um, do it just in their own home. So it's convenient at their own time, which is similar to smart step, of course, all those things. Um, and it is individualized to their own abilities and it progresses at their pace. 
Um, we have a huge variety of different exercises in there. Like it's an estimate of over 6,000 and we give feedback um, on progress continuously. Um, so we have, this is how it looks. So if you would start an exercise session, you can um, look at um, a video demonstration. Um, we are very culturally inclusive as well in our um, video demonstrations. So we have different cultures uh, being an exercise instructor, um, which is also something that um, was important, an important finding through our co-design sessions. Um, and um, so people then follow an avatar um, to do the exercises and there's no need um, for supervision while doing that. So it's it's very much self-guided. Um, as a physio, you can um, then check in the back end how your client or in our case, the researcher was able to check how their client was doing. So this is, of course, like it, it's a star participant, as you can see, um, always nicely adhering to a two hour dose um, over um, um, long period of time and they also do regular assessments as well um, to see how they are improving and how um, it is better and in the dashboard you can then also uh, kind of rank uh, your people to to see how well they're adhering or for any other markers that are of interest to you so that it is easy um, to identify who you would like to give a follow-up phone call um Standing tool is also designed that you can make changes. So if you are um, seeing a client, for example, you can um, make changes uh, based on uh, what the abilities are. So that is definitely something that we did in the research project as well, um, that certain categories and exercises were turned off for either safety or not to aggravate um, pain um, or any of existing conditions. Um, and that can be done both on the app itself or in the back end. So you don't have to go to the home of the person. Um, and then at the end of um, an exercise session, people are rating um, the exercise. So that way we can make sure that it is on the right level of, uh, or if it needs to uh, progress or regress um, at the next session. So I'll just quickly go through the different trials. I, I, I want to be quite quick in, in this so I, we can talk a little bit more at the end. Um, so I'll skip through a few of these slides quite quickly, but you can read about them um, in, um, yeah, they're published. So our first trial was in a group of low risk people. So we had um, just over 500 people recruited um, and um, the main difference of this trial um, so was that we asked people to be in the study for two years. Um, so what we did is we, um, we installed um, so this is a trial that started in 2012. Um, we installed the app in a person's home, um, which meant that we did an assessment to have the right starting level, show them how to navigate through the app, did a first session with them um, at home, which took about 60 to 90 minutes um, to do that. Um, in a second session, we also went to the home to make sure that they were all setting up their program safely in wh whichever room they uh, we had um, selected for them together um, for 30 minutes. And we also did some goal setting as well for um, the remainder of, of the trial. And then follow-up sessions were also um, um, done for the first six months if they were not doing their um, uh, if they were not following the the, the program um, for two consecutive weeks. Um, so this is the adherence that you can see of the first trial in a high uh, in a low risk um, group of people. So over the first six months, we still had eighty percent of our people um, using the program at that recommended dose of two hours per week. Um, after the six month mark, we did not follow people up anymore if they didn't adhere. And so we, you can see a clear drop, um, but it wasn't too low. So we still had 65% of the people using the app um, at 12 months and 52% without interaction. I just really wanna make that clear. Um, at two years. So that was a very exciting finding. Um, 
the experiences from people were very positive. They really liked the flexibility of the app. They enjoyed the program um, and they felt that they really um, improved as well and their confidence improved as well. And they felt very positive about the exercise demonstration. So they felt that they knew how to do the exercises based on that. Um, here are the results. Um, so the main results were at 12 months, which just missed out on significance. Um, but at two years, um, we did see um, a reduced um, falls rate of 16% and um, a, a reduced rate of injuries um, at uh, of 20% also at two years. And we also saw an improvement on some of the secondary outcome measures. We then did an economic analysis as well, and I'll just um, skip through to the end. But um, overall, what we saw is that um, it was um, cost effective and especially um, for people with a history of falls, standing tall dominated, um, meaning that it was less costly and more effect effective than usual, usual care. Um, so the cost that you can see there includes the cost of an iPad. So we had, uh, I didn't mention that, but our control group also received an iPad from us because we did not want to have that as an influence um, for uh, that novelty. Um, because at that time, iPads were very new. Many people hadn't seen one. <laughs> um, so it was very new. So then we did our second trial, which was in... Um, 580 people, um, 18 people at a higher risk of falls. And what we did there is that um, we, we provided a personalized combination of standing tall as you saw it before, um, as well as providing a brain training element on top of standing tall and a cognitive behavioral therapy program to address low mood. Um, High fall risk was defined as people who had either had a fall in the past two months, uh, six months, um, had fear of falling or were aged 60, 80 plus. Um, so this is the cognitive motor training or the brain training. So you can see it is it is very much the standing tall look, but it has that additional element of cognitive brain training attached to it where we were um we it's based on um cognitive tests like um animal naming um and uh, the FAS so you kind of um are asked to listen to the words provided and then remember just the words starting with an A for example and then give that number so it's very much a distraction method um as part of our balance exercises and then we were working together with Black Dog, which is just right next door to Neura, um, and integrated their My Compass program for low mood. Um, in this trial, we had a bit of an issue with COVID, as so many of us. Halfway through, um, we had to um, really switch to um, a different way of delivering the intervention, being moving all the way from home visits to telehealth. Um, and we did that successfully. Um, and um, so we changed the ethics around and then we kept recruiting. And you can see that the rate of recruitment didn't drop, um, which was very good. Um, and um, it uh, definitely was a very worthwhile experience for us um, to notice the difference that we could make um, to people in this difficult time. Um, so here you can see the number of people who had two hours of balance, which was either just standing tall or um, with cognitive uh, brain training, which was uh, the majority of the people, about 75%. Um, then we had about 30% of the people who had three hours. So that was either three hours of pure balance or two plus one hour of the cognitive training. Um, and a surprisingly low number um, were offered um, CBT. Um, so here you can see the results at um, 12 months and six months. So 12 months was, again, our primary outcome that we had the same just missing out on. Um, but what is very interesting is that we saw a 29% reduction at six months um, in falls rates and a 42% reduction in injurious um, falls at, also at six months. And we had some interesting secondary outcomes as well. 
um, which is actually very, uh, we, we need to look at this a bit more, but it's very exciting to see that during COVID, our intervention group actually didn't reduce their exercise, um, their planned exercise and their standing time as well. And their mood also remained stable. So that is very exciting. We'll, we need to look at this a little bit more, what that actually means. One thing that we did see, which was disappointing, is that our attrition was a lot higher than in the first trial. Um, it will be very hard to understand why that is. We do think COVID has a big role in this because as soon as the lockdown stopped, people wanted to really get out and, and do things and not necessarily stay in home and do their standing tall. Um, so we will try and understand this a bit better, but it might be tricky. So this also meant that our adherence was a bit lower in this trial, but people who did keep exercising did have that high levels of adherence still. So we just need to um, address the stickiness of it, I guess, um, in a real world. Um, so, and this is a, a meta-analysis of the two trials, which shows that we can now say that we can reduce falls by 19% um, across a wider variety of people with high and low risk of falls. We also did an implementation study, which we did in Australia and the UK. Um, so, um, and this was a six month trial that also got interrupted um, by COVID. Um, but I just wanna focus here on our adherence because it was also a lot lower than in the first trial. Um, and, uh, but here we really, um, the, the reason for this is primarily because this is a real world challenge. Um, and um, this is something that is very important as well as part of our implementation of a, a program into um, practice. We really need to address the barriers and the facilitators of practice. We did have that COVID problem in the middle, which was actually adding a substantial challenge that we could obviously could not have foreseen because we all of a sudden had to um, implement telehealth and um but Morag is here and Sandra is here. They were part of this study, so they were, they can uh, relate. Um, but so overall, um, if the in the people who were exercising, it was about half um, the dose that they reached uh, compared to the first clinical trial. So this was also a low group of people, low risk group of people. Um, but the people who did exercise, they did um, say that they improved quite substantially. So overall, it did suggest effectiveness in that way. Um, the program was feasible, definitely on the point of clients. Um, however, like for a clinician, we would say it was moderately feasible at the way we had implemented it. Um, so it definitely needs a bit more work to make sure that we actually get a back end that is integrated into people's systems so they don't have to check different websites because that's where it actually breaks down. Um, and if a person is doing their exercises but the clinician is not following up, that's kind of where it you, you kind of miss a little bit of that feedback that we relied on in the clinical trial. But we were able to... Um, um, tackle the challenges of COVID. So I'll say that we had good operational feasibility. Um, we definitely saw that we had um, some barriers to adoption um, related to um, personal challenges and competing interests. Um, but one thing that I would also like to say is that um, there is also a bit of a perceived um, or a perception by health professionals that older people might not always be able to use this program um, or a technical technology program. Um, and that is something that has kind of made, a, made us um, uh, advocates against ageism a little bit because we do feel that it is very possible and um, it is all about giving it a go. And we have never had a problem in our trials with usability. Um, so I'll just skip through this. Um, so one of the things like around sustainability um, is that what we heard from the health professionals is that they absolutely saw it as a program that they could use. 
um, and also as a maintenance program after they would have seen their clients for another condition such as a musculoskeletal condition. But the main barrier that was mentioned really was funding, um, that um, it is currently our our um, our service uh, services are not set up for following up through telehealth for things like this. So as long as we don't have that available for reimbursement, it's likely to not be done outside of a research project, which is fair enough. Um, we... Um, we also did a little trial in mild cognitive impairment and we showed that we could improve gait and we did a feasibility study. This was led by Morag um, in 15 people with dementia, showing that people with dementia could easily use the program as well. So what are we doing next? Um, so we are now implementing um, our program into aged care. Um, so community aged care, I, I should specify. Um, so people who are still independent living and like to integrate it into home care packages. Um, and we are spending a lot of time on co-design with aged care providers um, at the moment. So we're doing interviews, we're doing focus groups, um, and the idea is to really come up with a process map, implementation map, so that we actually... Um, can follow the right steps, identify the barriers before we start and the facilitators and have those strategies readily available uh, before starting um, our implementation pilot, which should then set us up to actually make it available. Um, and this is my last slide, um, which is about commercialization. Dana already mentioned that it is a huge challenge to commercialize research, um, especially um, yeah, for us, I guess, who have never done this before. Um, and uh, I'd like to say that, so I started this work in 2011 with the first co-design. So we're 2024 now, so it's it's quite a long time. Um, we have done all the discovery. Um, we have done, um, we have got an MVP. Um, we have now got a development grant that will allow us to develop standing tool into a commercial product, which means that it would also have like some service provision um, and making sure that yeah, if people no, don't know how to use the app, that they don't need to call my research assistance, <laughs> which would not work. Um, but there is still a huge issue, which is called um, a lovely name. I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but it's called the Valley of Death. Um, and it's um, very well known in uh, translation um, of research. And um, this is absolutely where we are sitting. Um, so we have done everything we can, but to actually get to commercialization, as in uh, being able to sell the product, there is quite a lot to do in about um, either licensing or setting up a company. Um, and we have some plans and we have some ideas, well, more than some, uh, but it is still absolutely um, a hard um, thing to do and hopefully we will succeed. Um, so I'll just kind of skip like, to the end of my conclusion, but um, overall I think we can say that Standing Tall works. Um, Standing Tall is acceptable to both older people and health professionals. Um, but we need the health professionals to be involved in the delivery of standing tall, especially in people with a higher risk of falling, probably less so in people with a lower risk of falling. Um, and to enable this, we will um, require some funding model, models that actually support digital health integration into practice. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim. Gosh. Lots, so much impressive work. If we come back to, um, yeah, together, do we have, we've got one minute left. If anyone has a quick question for Kim, monitoring my screen in the chat. All righty. We will wrap up then, um, being two o'clock, but thank you again, Dana and Kim, for, um, brilliant you know talk so much work and so much um yeah potential so um thank you everyone for joining uh look out for um the flies for the upcoming guest lecture in may and our um upcoming other cre events and enjoy the rest of your afternoon and long weekend once you all get there <laughs>